I think I've seen a few posts on the Forest Preserve District page um, already of some spring wildflower photos. Okay, all right. Um, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna share the screen um, at home here. I'm sharing. What I'm gonna do is share some previously shot um, uh, exhibit footage of our special exhibit um, to help with tonight's live virtual tour. So you should be seeing my screen on your end. And we're gonna get started with tonight's tour. So as you can see here, we're out in front of the Museum of the Grand Prairie at Great Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve um, and getting ready to walk through that front door to have an awesome virtual experience here. Um, the Museum of the Grand Prairie, uh, since 1968, uh, our, mu our museum has been a local history museum, uh, collecting, preserving, and interpreting the cultural and natural history of Champaign County in East Central Illinois. And here we are, walking inside, there's our museum store, which is chock full of a whole bunch of women's suffrage related merchandise that, you know, when, hopefully when we're open soon, you'll be able to come on in and purchase some of that. Um, and it'll be tied right to uh, the special exhibit that we'll be giving you a tour of tonight. And here we are in this big building. You know, I mentioned this last week, but a lot of people say that it's, uh, that, that our first time visitors, man, this place is so much bigger than what I thought it would be, you know, when they first walk in the door, but we, it's full. It's full of awesome exhibits. That exhibit that we just saw will be the exhibit that you see tonight in the special live tour, especially with that sisterhood mural uh, created by local students. But it's chock full of local history, natural history, cultural history, and the building um, is a historic artifact itself. It's been there since 1968, as I already mentioned. And there's so many things you can explore upstairs, downstairs, um, uh, and another thing people say is this museum goes on and on forever and ever, and they could spend so much time in here. And we hope that you could spend, uh, you know, a good amount of time in there once we open up uh, to the public. There's our uh, exhibit, the Grand Prairie Story, which we did a live virtual tour of uh, just over a week ago. So check that out on our Facebook page. Here's a case exhibit um, on uh, uh, local um, uh, D-Day related history from World War II. And then you can even see downstairs there a little bit into the basement into our new Discovering Home exhibit and some stops on the Looking for Lincoln Trail in the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area, which we are a part of. All right, so going first off here, uh, Barb, I'm gonna let you take this over. Uh, okay. Take it over from here, but this is our photo booth. This is our photo booth. We, uh, every, every new exhibit, every new special exhibit we do, we have a photo booth. And this, this time it's, uh, you can stand in front of the White House and, um, pretend to be uh, a, a protester. The suffragists were the first protesters in front of the White House. Women call, who called themselves the silent sentinels actually stood in front of the White House for two years uh, campaigning for votes for women. And those, those banners you saw were actual re reproductions of the banners that they used. And you might've noticed that one of them would say, how long must women wait uh, Mr. President, and that is where we got the name of the, the new exhibit. Um, this, one of the Silent Sentinels was actually the daughter of the former um, Vice President Adlai Stevenson, that daughter-in-law, um, and she, many of these women were, were actually cast into jail and spent a month in jail um, just for disturbing the peace. Now, obviously they don't look like they're disturbing the peace, do they? <laughs> um, now we're gonna enter the exhibit. We have um, a place where you can share your own story about uh, uh, what doors have opened and closed to. And we also have kind of an ex auxiliary exhibit that was put together by some students at uh, Franklin uh, Steam Academy. Here's the entrance to the exhibit. How long must women wait? Um, you can see there's a banner across the top of that exhibit. We have some women we feature in the exhibit. Well, the first one is, um, well, <laughs> here's our opening text um, where we talk about how women didn't have the vote until 1920. Um, uh, Potawatomi woman, Abigail Adams, Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, Ida B. Wells, uh, local girl, Zay Wright, Frida Coates and Doris Hoskins. These are ladies that we talk about in the exhibit. Some of them were for the, most of them were for the vote. One of them was against. We also um, feature our own uh, ballot box. And uh, the ballot box is quite important later on 
uh, this is a this is a, a poster that the uh, League of Women Voters put out encouraging women to vote. Ballot box is from Hensley Town Hall from Hensley Township uh, in Western Champaign County, um, and it's uh, it was. Uh, Used in 1896, probably still in use in 1920 when women got the vote. It's certainly in use probably in 1913 when Illinois women got uh, to vote for president for the first time. We move on to the beginning of the exhibit, um, where which we call early days. This is before women were really talking about um, wanting the vote. Um, feature some some early residents of the county. Um, but the very first thing we talk about is what does suffrage mean? Suffrage just basically means the right to vote. It, suffrage was a ballot in, in ancient Rome and it came to mean just being able to vote. So women wanted to be able to vote. Abigail Adams asked her husband when he was working on the constitution to remember the ladies, remember that ladies would like to be able to vote too. Um, nobody paid attention. But um, we like to talk about that because obviously the idea was in everybody's mind, even when we formed the what formed the country. Um, we uh, we talk a little bit about Native American women because they um, many of the uh, Native American women, um, particularly the ones that lived in this area, the Potawatomi. Um, had a more decision making role in their um, in their culture. And Matilda Gage, who was a suffragist in the end of the 19th century, hooked on to this and decided that um, that women really should uh, pay attention to Native American culture because they they were onto something that that uh, Western culture hadn't caught up with yet. This was. Um, Tamush Kiki Oz is one of the people we talk about. Um, in her culture, she had quite a bit of power. This is a Potawatomi basket um, from uh, around 1830. We borrowed from the Illinois State Museum. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Um, one of the kinds of things that Potawatomi ladies made. Um, and this stall, which uh, looks very similar to the one that uh, Mush Kiki uh, was wearing. It's actually a, a modern shawl um, that the museum purchased. Um, and uh, Potawatomi women are still making um, shawls and um, supporting their culture that way. Um, we talked about silences in history. A lot of women are not known because they just weren't written about. Melinda Bryan is one person who we do know about in the early 19th century in Champaign County. Um, and these are pieces from her home. She lived in um, in what was later called the Nine Dial Tavern. She was the first white woman to be married in Champaign County, married in 1833, just after the county um, was founded. There's a plate, a lice comb, some buttons, another plate. Um, talk a little bit about it. Abigail Adams. We're fortunate enough in our in our uh, collection to have uh, pieces from Abigail Adams' era. Uh, these are obviously not hers, but there's a um, lamp from that era, an inkwell, and also um, a quill pen from the colonial era. So fortunately, I mean, she wasn't local, but uh, her, import, her story is important. Um, this is Myra Bradwell. Myra Bradwell was a woman who wrote the law to allow women to inherit property, but <clears throat> was not able to be a lawyer herself until late in her life. This is the College of Law of U of I in 1907 on uh, a law book. And it's important for women to be able to inherit property, as you'll see in the next frame, because um, Narcissa Adams. 1854, die, her, her husband died. She wasn't able to inherit the property. Her son wasn't able to inherit the property. Abraham Lincoln presided as judge when some two men who, were, who took on the role of guardians for the boy uh, actually sued for, um, I'm sorry, it's, it, it's 
sued for her to be able to give the property to her son. This is Jane Patton. We have a, the Forest Preserve has a piece of land in the northeast part of the county that belonged to the Patton family, was donated eventually to the, to the uh, Forest Preserve. Jane Patton was a, is a legend in the county. We don't know if she was ever, she was, she lit, died in 1921, just after women got the vote. We don't know if she ever voted. Um, but what we do know is that um, she was a, a strong um, woman who uh, influenced a lot of people. Um, these are wildflowers that actually bloom in her, in the land that we have that um, belong to Jane. And um, we know a lot about Jane's life because she wrote Remembrances of a Pioneer. She told us about um, how uh, she um, assisted in um, births and, uh, and assisted in preparing people for funerals. She um, uh, was a, an ace at gardening at, um, and she had many sheep. She wove, uh, she spun wool and, and um, took, this, the, took the wool to um, the weavers who were typically men. Um, and she, the most interesting thing about Jane is that these are, these are baby bottles, believe it or not, and a nipple shield. Amazing, amazing life that she led. Um, she, she apparently assisted at the birth of 102 babies. And um, Jane's husband died in 1880. And she was just able to inherit his property, but she also inherited all of his debt. Um, but by 1921, she had acquired 2,500 acres and made an amazing concern out of her family's farm. She, um, uh, we, we wanted to feature what the life of a woman was like before uh, the uh, suffrage uh, quest really got started. So that's what why we included Jane. Um, the second section is called the national stage and it's about how the national quest for uh, suffrage got started and um, how that w impacted uh, our local history. Um, so on the national stage in 1848, Elizabeth Cady Stanton organized the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. It was generally called uh, Seneca Falls. There's Sojourner Truth. She was a uh, avid suffragist as well. Um, Failure is impossible was uh, Susan B. Anthony's was an early suffragist um, was pretty much her her watchwords um, and she uh, appeared in uh, Champagne in 1870. There's a there's the uh, newspaper notice of it. Um, she started a, a newspaper called the Revolution. She was the the lecture she gave was about women's wages in when she was here in Champaign County. She spoke in Farmer City. Well, she didn't speak in Farmer City, but a month later, um, there was a meeting in Farmer City and uh, which was called the Revolution. Um, so obviously the message got on from, from her, her appearance and it was well received in Farmer City. Um, Below there's there's a modern button which has, features her her uh, face and is um, says failure is impossible. This plaque was borrowed from um, Spurlock Museum, and it talks about it's, it has a quote at the bottom. On her last birthday, just before she died, she gave her last the contents of her small purse to um, to the suffrage cause in Oregon. Uh, this is a Stanhope viewer. It has a little picture of um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton in it, also borrowed from the Spurlock, and uh, was kind of a souvenir at women's rights conventions. That's uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton with one of her daughters. She had many children. Uh, Susan B. Anthony was the, um, the woman who did all the campaigning. Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote 
wrote the documents. She wrote a document called the Declaration of Sentiment, which was meant to be a, um, a, a corollary to the Declaration of Independence, but for women's rights. Um, we also featured Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth spoke in uh, Bloomington in the 1870s. Um, she talked about uh, um, women's rights as well. Um, and uh, she actually also spoke about um, incidents of domestic violence and spoke against it. Um, and we, we have a wonderful uh, recording. Um, we were allowed to, uh, to have the whole recording of Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech um, from Carrie Washington. Um, who's the, Pat, remind me who the, who the provider is? Uh, people, uh, People's History of the United States. Yeah, that's it, yeah. right. So you can listen to this if you come to see us. <laughs> um, it's yeah, really we interesting. Hear it that hear it that well right now. I thought we might be able to, but sorry. No, it's good. Um, interesting thing about this speech is that it's often given as a uh, in a Southern dialect, but um, Sojourner Truth probably had a Dutch accent. She was raised in the Dutch part of New York as a slave and was freed later. Frederick Douglass came to Champaign twice. Probably the first time he spoke about. Um, suffrage, but just after women's suffrage, but just after that, he uh, had an argument with the suffragists, and while they made up later in life, he was actually the only man to speak at the first women's rights convention. Um, then we talk about uh, about the um, local women who were involved in that national um, struggle. Um, you just saw that uh, you see a wedding dress and it's in a it's in a rag and then it's not and it's not a rag it's a cover cloth. Um, could you stop it for a second, Pat? Sorry, I'll go back to that. Okay. Um, it's because this is how it looks when it's on display, but since we've had to close, um, we wanted to cover keep pests and dust off the dress. And so it has to be covered for the moment. Um, but when we reopen, and I'm saying when, not if, <laughs> when we reopen, um, we will be able to uh, 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 uncover the dress. So you'll be able to see it in the way it appeared first in this, in this film. Okay, go ahead, Pat, sorry. Sure. Oh no. I just thought that was important. Oh, sure. Um, uh, two ladies, Elgin Ray and Mary Melissa Harris, uh, went to um, Washington, D.C. in 1888. And there was a women's club convention by none other than Elizabeth A. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And they were, they were encouraging women to form clubs, to do good deeds. To, to change society basically, and then thus change attitudes about suffrage. Um, one of the, those two women um, brought back the idea of having a social and political science club. And one of the major uh, members of that was Julia Burnham for whom the Burnham uh, hospital was named because she gave, her husband gave money in her memory, um, but she had the idea. And um, that social and political science club was also behind uh, the first library in Champaign. I think it was actually the first hospital in the county. Um, there's Mary Melissa Harris. Uh, many members of this family were involved in, um, not only in the suffrage struggle, but also in uh, uh, doing uh, good works for the, for the county. And uh, one of them was Mary Burnham Harris, who was Julia's daughter. This is her wedding dress. And these are the other members of the family um, have been involved in uh, local um, good works uh, for generations. So the dress has a big story and you I encourage you to come see the uh, see the legacy of commitment. 
um, here we have the one uh, case we dedicated to the anti-suffrage movement. Um, in the early, early 20th century, uh, women who were now going out to work were encouraged to use hat pins. Look at those things, they are terrifying. It, in defense of themselves, um, in case someone had tried to attack them, because men were not accustomed to women go being out in, in the working world. And um, can we go back a, a second there to that, to that hat pin holder? That, there you go. I just wanted to see the the gaping mouth on that on that woman there. That's a hat pin holder, and it's making fun of the fact that women had were in, being encouraged to use their hat pins. And it says no boat on the bottom of it. Okay, go on, Pat. Sorry, <laughs> gotta stop stopping you. <laughs> video seems to mess up. Okay, there we go. We're good. Thank you. Um, there were a lot of uh, anti-suffrage uh, um, propaganda, so to speak. Um, Belva Lockwood was made fun of there. She was the first woman to run, uh, second woman to run for president. Um, then there were lots of statues like that one where women were made to seem like they were shrieking maniacs. Um, there were lots of pipes that were sold, making fun of women. That one is, says no votes on it, the first one. Um, and there was a lot of uh, hysteria that women would begin to smoke. And that was seen as an awful thing. That was just uh, gonna be the worst world possible. And there's the floor. <laughs> Here we have Zay Wright. Zay Wright was a young girl whose um, diary the museum owns. And um, she loved to pretend to be Annie Oakley. Fascinating thing about this is that she, in her diary, she says that she is against suffrage, that she thinks women should be happy to be at home. Um, and, the, and the funny thing is Annie Oakley, believe it or not, who was a, a master sharpshooter um, was also against suffrage. She thought women should be able, Annie Oakley thought women should be able to fight in uh, combat in the military, but she did not think that women should be um, able to vote. So we, we, we leave, very happily leave the anti-suffrage movement right there. <laughs> These two ladies couldn't have been more for suffrage. This is Eliza Vincent on the left and Lily Bell Sale on the right, two ladies who went to the 1913 suffrage parade. Alice Paul, who was the head of the suffrage movement by the beginning of the 20th century, decided that going to uh, Washington DC and making a big parade deal out of it would get, gain a lot of visibility for the suffrage movement and it did. Um, and these, there were three women. Uh, the third one was uh, Edith Dobbins, who went to that parade. Uh, this is about how in 1913, look at, can you stop at that map for a second? Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, see how uh, the, uh, the states in white are all the Western states that had passed partial or full suffrage uh, laws before the uh, national amendment. And see uh, on the right, all the women who are, are, who are striving towards liberty in the, uh, in the west part of the, the country. Illinois passed uh, suffrage in 1913, partial suffrage, but a lot and um, was isn't widely credited as the first state west of the Mississippi to pass, uh, pass a suffrage bill and allow women to vote for, and they did, were able to vote for president. Hey, go ahead, Pat, sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. All right, this is the section that's actually about suffrage, uh, about the women getting the vote in 1913. Uh, June 26, 1913, the governor signed the bill. There he is signing the bill. 
His wife is on the left looking over his shoulder. But uh, women were not allowed to vote for uh, a lot of things that you would think they would be able to, like county supervisors. Um, there is a video here that tells the whole story of the, um, the women's suffrage fight in Illinois. In this case, we have a, an original banner from the suffrage parade in 1913, um, that, uh, a, a sash actually that women would, would have worn across their chest in that parade. Um, there were some say as many as 10,000 women. It was really the first time there was a march on Washington. Um, this is borrowed from uh, uh, Spurlock as well. Um, and then freezing. Okay. Uh, there's Lily Bell Sale in her beautiful Illinois uniform. Um, the suffrage parade had lots of women dressed in white. White was was a symbol of purity, purple of um, loyalty, and yellow of hope. And you, so you notice a lot of things that are purple, yellow, and white in this exhibit. This is a medal uh, from the hunger strike in England. Um, and they were given to all the women who participated in the hunger, in hunger strikes or, um, or protests in England. Um, and this, is, this actually has a woman's individual name on it. She was in a protest in, uh, in which they broke windows in Whitehall, which is not the greatest idea. Um, and the difference actually between suffragette and suffragist, you notice I say mostly suffragist, is that a suffragettes are the British women and they were more um, radical than American women. And so American women did not want to be called suffragettes because that, that denoted um, more violent action. Pat, did you stop it or is it frozen? I stopped it. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, now we need to get started again. There it goes. Okay. Um, there's a doll here. This is suffragette doll. You can see there's an image of a woman wearing one of those sashes actually a magazine illustration um, from the, the era. And there's the doll client with, with her sash on. Um, this is a University of Illinois allowed women in uh, 1880. Um, this is a handbook for women to learn how to vote. And those women that were graduating there were, um, one of them was a woman who wrote the book on how to, how to vote. Um, we feature Catherine Cheeseboro, who is a local uh, woman who our blacksmith shop in, in the museum is, was donated by her family. Um, she was a school teacher. She had to quit teaching school in order to get married. Um, she then became the accountant for the blacksmith shop. And eventually she uh, gave talks about sex education um, to local groups. Um, it was her way of, um, of uh, empowering women in that era. Um, there were lots of magazines that were dedicated to women getting the vote. This one's a suffragist, has women knocking on the door of, uh, of the, the polling booth. Um, these are local people who campaign for, with, for women to vote. You might notice that one of them says, special invitation to our newest voters, the women. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, women after they got the vote, um, were felt somewhat liberated. And one of we are the loveliest things we have is this beautiful flapper dress from the early 1920s. Women got the vote in 1920. So I thought it was appropriate to, to show you where, where women went from there. 
the beautiful dress. And there's some flappers dancing in with the, with the Capitol building in the background, obviously um, enjoying their new freedom. Two things that were really instrumental in passing suffrage was uh, was World War One and and actually prohibition. Um, and one of the most hearty suffragists of Champaign County was Mary Busey, whose son died in World War One. Um, the women fought hard for the war to be won. They they were ambulance drivers and served overseas and they also did a lot of work at home just like in World War II. And um then then they then they asked for the vote and said why can't you know why can't we vote now that we've done all this work? Um and and there you see <laughs> a woman in uniform and a woman driving in uniform and it says win the war women the motor driver and this woman Anna Howard Shaw Came to um, Urbana in, her, in the 1890s uh, campaigning for women's, women's uh, suffrage, but she was really a uh, proponent uh, during the war period. Um, the, if we if we pan up to this corset ad, it was a, it was a, sold at uh, Robeson's, um, and it says if you're if you have a, the right fitting corset, you will. Why women in the wartime insist on gossard corsets. The original, uh, the idea was that you would, we would be more efficient at your work if you had a well-fitting corset. So um, I thought that was a great, uh, and then it, and it was wartime, so you had to be efficient in your work. I thought that was a great uh, commentary on uh, where the culture was at the time. Uh, and then, of course, if women were were driving in the war, they, uh, and and that was a newfound freedom for women too, that they could drive, they would wear a duster like this. So we thought that was a beautiful, beautiful duster. Um, so temperance and suffrage, they're, they're actually the women who were, uh, promoting prohibition were actually also for um for suffrage because they wanted the right to make decisions about their own home life um there's a there was a statue in front of the flatiron building in urbana of francis willard who was the president for many many years of the uh, women's christian temperance union um she was a hero to many and she wrote a book called um, the Home Protection Manual in which she talks very much about how uh, women should be able to vote so they can make decisions about uh, about alcohol for one thing and, and protecting their families. Um, the mayor of Urbana was really on that, uh, had that same idea and was very much for suffrage and against liquor in his town at the time. There's a battle capper because after prohibition was put in place, <laughs> um, people had to make their alcohol at home. So, and this is actually from, from Champaign. Go ahead, Pat. Sorry. No problem. Um, and then, uh, Faith played a big role in um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and also in um, many women of faith were uh, like for suffrage. The YMCA actually provided, um, which is the Young Women's Christian Association, provided the first housing at uh, the University of Illinois and also um, got together um, athletic teams at the University of Illinois, women. Not really a surprise. Um, in August of 1920, suffrage was finally granted to women. Um, May of, 20, of 1990, 1919, uh, there was an attempt 
uh, well, the the um, let's just go for it. <laughs> the um, there's the Nineteenth Amendment: the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. There you have it. William Brown McKinley was our um, was a state representative at the time uh, from Champaign. Um, or was he a senator? Ugh, I don't remember. Anyway, he voted for it. Um, suffrage was ratified in large part by Republican states. Can we go back up to that? The Champaign County, okay, here we go. 29 Republican states and seven, seven Democratic states actually um, ratified the uh, the amendment that, that allowed women to have uh, the right to vote. Um, so that's an interesting uh, breakdown to me. Go ahead. To your left, you can see that the Champaign County um, League of Women Voters um, was uh, one of the was one of the first in Illinois. Um, happened right away. There was actually an, a Twin City Equal Suffrage Association that kind of morphed into that. After when we talk about uh, women getting the vote, we talk about how for a while there wasn't a lot more activity um, because the Depression happened pretty much right after that, and then World War II and. The 50s was about recovering, but there were a lot of women at work, including at the Illinois Glove Company. Here we have a picture um, that was loaned to us uh, from the Illinois Glove Company, in which you see many, many women working. Um, is, it, is it stuck? It was, it's freezing a little bit, but it's okay. okay. Um, there are lots of women at the U of I at that time as well. Um, there's a, uh, there are a couple of instances of women working during the war, including Irene Pellucci, who worked at, uh, in Peoria for Caterpillar um, and had to sign her name with her initials in order for her work to be approved. Um, that's her comptometer. And there's some gloves to the right uh, that were made at the Illinois Glove Factory. Men did the cutting, women did the sewing. Okay, now we make a giant leap. <laughs> Several decades later, the women's movement is revived when uh, the Equal Rights Amendment, which uh, grants rights beyond, beyond voting to women happens during the late 60s and up through the 80s, um, there's a national ERA march for ratify, ratification in Illinois. We talk here about um, how that gets started. Early in the 60s, Betty Friedan, who is funnily enough from Peoria, um, writes a book called The Feminine Mystique. It really gets women um, fired up about um, having the equal rights to vote not to vote to uh, to all the other things that that women would want rights to right the right to be paid at the same amount and and it's really interesting because this is the same stuff that Susan B Anthony was was wanting uh, 150 years earlier there's some buttons from the era um, movement um an ERA bracelet that actually belonged to one of the cheese bros. Um, and a couple of t-shirts from different ERA walks. Uh, the ERA in Illinois is a complicated story. Uh, they passed it in the House at one year and then they didn't pass it in the Senate the next year, but they never managed to pass it in both uh, cameras of the legislature at the same time. And so it never passed in Illinois until very recently. Um, there was a hope at the last minute in uh, 1980s to, um, to pass it. One, one last attempt 
and these are all um, local uh, local donor uh, or lender um, allowed us to use many of the pieces from that era. There's a Kristen Lems album. Kristen Lems was, was a local um, woman who helped to begin the uh, Women's Music Festival in in uh, at the U of I. Um, and on June 3rd, 1982, using images of, of suffragists from earlier, uh, a day of rebellion was planned at the Capitol. Women chained themselves to the uh, to the uh, railing in the Senate chamber um, and um, in order to to get the ERA to pass, it unfortunately did not happen. Um, but it did happen later. These are these are some um, posters that we recently uh, were were offered for donation to us um, from those ERA uh, marches, mostly from the National Organization of Women. Um, and then we talk a little bit about. Uh, how women uh, have become more and more active since getting the right to vote in politics. Um, we have some local, the two mayors of Urbana and Champaign, um, but also we talk about um, Carol Mosley Braun, who was the first African-American woman in the Senate from uh, Northern Illinois. We talk about Title IX, which happened as a direct result of the women's of the women's liberation uh, movement in the 80s and 90s, before before Title IX, girls were pretty much resigned to being cheerleaders. But now this is the current Franklin jersey for basketball. Um, there was also a great great deal of work done towards protecting women uh, against the violence that they had experienced in their own lives. Um, we talk some about the founding of um, a woman's place, and this is a safe, there's a poster from the Safe Place, which is from the Office of Women's Programs at the U of I. The Take Back the Night uh, movement, and um, it seems to me that you uh, talk a little. We talk a little bit about Helen Satterthwaite, who was in the legislature during the 70s and was worked hard for the ERA to pass. And we just heard about Helen Satterthwaite in the news because she she uh, left her left Clark Lindsay to um, to vote and was quarantined afterwards. <laughs> um, okay, and then we talked just a tiny, tiny little bit about what's happening now uh, for women's rights. There are still, of course, women protesting for uh, to be heard, the Me Too movement, of course, is part of this. And this is a photograph from the local um, Women's March on in March 2017. Um, there's, a, there's a small section about the Courage, Con Courage Connection, which is a descendant of several different women's organizations. This is, this is a poster from the 1980s. Um, about ending violence against women. And there's a actually, um, if one would experience violence, there's a there's a route to get help there. Um, we talk about the Women's March. We also talk a, a little bit about um, uh, Doris Hoskins, for whom we have uh, an. Uh, her archive of African-American uh, information. We talk about how the um, women's movement now is uh, attempting to be more intersectional, meaning all people, all women. Um, and then we also talk about um, how there are there, this is a video we put together about, because we have so much information about the women's movement in the 80s that we put together a, a, 
a video about all the different um, groups that worked towards passing the ERA. And we're back to Doris again. <laughs> All right, and in the case, we have some things from that local march recently. I love that one. A woman's place is in the resistance and see it's Princess Leia's hair. That's so great. I love that poster. <laughs> it's fun, right? <laughs> so then outside of the exhibit, we have um, two things. We have a, a response board for, um, there's some buttons from Hillary Clinton's campaign. Of course, she was the first woman to run it for president from a major political party. And there you have it, my friends. You have to come back and see it when it's in real life. <laughs> so uh, one of our, our um, staff members, Katie Snyder, worked with um, an artist, uh, Mandy Danowitz, and the students at uh, the Franklin Steam Academy to put together a small exhibit called the Sisterhood Exhibit, which of course is a is a companion to the to the larger suffrage exhibit. Um, they designed uh, what they wanted to be on a door that would be a metaphorical door about their lives, what they hope to be, and what they hope. Uh, their lives will be about. First, we had a, a field trip with them. We talked about suffrage and also about what, what it's like to work in a museum. Then they worked on their door with the artist. And uh, it has a, these, this is the, the empowered sisterhood women on the outside of the door. And then if you open the door, so please open the door. <laughs> oh, I love your white white uh, gloves pad. I didn't see this before. There's There are questions where you ask your, about, you were asked to think about your own life and what doors have been opened and closed. And these are the things that are behind that closed door for those young women. Um, yeah. Hi, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you? Have you struggled? Can you imagine what it's like to be a black or brown girl? Would you feel different if you were another color? Do you like who you are? How do you feel in your own skin? Do you matter? Who are you? Well, that one's profound. <laughs> it's really a lovely piece of work. Unfortunately, um, while that we were working on this project, one of the young ladies um, passed away. Uh, and uh, so the students that were working with her, the other students wanted this to be a memorial to Kijona, but there she is. And we wanna thank all of the, the hard work of all of the educators who worked with these young women, as well as the artist. Now, Pat, I'll let you do this one. And we just have, just real quick, there's a an exhibit speaker series happening this year where each month, starting at the end of this month with our virtual history on tap, that'll, that's a, that'll happen on our Facebook page. We're gonna put on events and, uh, and programs tied to the exhibit. And thankfully we're able to do that with all those sponsors that were just featured uh, there at the bottom. So stay tuned for those events and I hope that they can take place this summer. Yeah, yeah, I do too. I really if, do. If not, we'll figure out some sort of virtual format or an alternative plan or something. So, so this is a this is a, a response board for you. When you come, we want you to tell us what doors have been opened or closed, open for you or closed to you. Um, and and we've had some really great responses already. Um, Pat has made a question mark. <laughs> Um, 
this woman wanted to be on Little League and also wasn't wasn't allowed to, and she was also not allowed to be an altar boy. But then right below that, the woman writes that um, she was um, she had to teach the the uh, altar boys to speak the Latin, but she wasn't allowed to be an altar boy herself. So there's two different people. I thought that was really interesting. That those are two people who had that door closed to them. Um, open doors where my mom was a television personality. And then, um, is it stuck? It's moving a little slow, but okay. it'll, come on, there it goes. And then my mother got a master's degree in chemistry in 1946. And my daughter became a doctor. My son became a teacher, smashing stereotypes. I love this. And then this person said, how many things was the door closed to him for? Him? And, and uh, that woman was, right, I'm assuming some woman was devoted from chair because she was, because there were childcare arrangements. So you can see people um, have, uh, have lots of stories to tell about um, how their gender has uh, has influenced their lives. Good. So there we are. We saw it all, man. That was it. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was good. It was a, a lot of history packed into, you know, one exhibit there. So. Oh, and I have like 90 times more to tell you. Oh, I, well, that's why people will have to come and see for themselves. Right. That's you know? right. That's right. Once we open up here soon, yeah. hopefully. So. Um, well, um, Barb, you got anything else to say? No, I just want to thank everybody who watched, everybody who, <laughs> who put up with uh, our uh, our connection speed. And, yeah, and, and we had a few snaps. Yeah, was it? We'd love to love to hear what you thought, and um, and we would love to see you here again. Pat, you have another one of these coming up, right? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I don't have a date set quite yet, but I'm hoping oh, okay. to do um, either a virtual tour of uh, the, the next one will either be our uh, uh, interactive exhibit downstairs in our basement, uh, Discovering Home, um, or I'm looking to do um, a virtual tour of the blacksmith exhibit, you know, school, the schoolhouse, you know, some notable uh, points of interest on the museum campus, and then also Look to do some virtual things with uh, the covered bridge at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve, which is pretty historic, as well as a high tower at Lake of the Woods Forest oh, Preserve. Oh, what a great idea! That's great. And then, yeah, and then hope to do some other, you know, historical points of interest, whether they're at Forest Preserve District property um, or close to it. You know, maybe even something about Hazen Bridge or you know other points of interest uh, within the county, some local history. That's great. Uh, yeah. Great. Well, uh, look forward to it. Yep, I'll do one in. Uh, I'll do one next week. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks to everybody uh, for watching. Uh, we had some people comment uh, where they were from. You know, feel free to keep those comments going. Uh, let us know what you thought. If you have any other questions, we got people watching in Muhammad, uh, Gibson City, uh, uh, Amelia. Hello from Japan. Heart. Uh, uh, I don't know who that could be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Muhammad Seymour, uh, Amy Olschleiger, St. Charles, Missouri, as well. Too. I don't know who she could be related to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, but thanks everybody for watching. Um, uh, and again, you know, come out and see this exhibit in person because, as Barb said, she, there's so much that you could see, um, so much that you could learn from, so much to do at the museum, as well as you know, at Lake Woods Horse Preserve. So. I wanted to I wanted to say that one of our comments is from Laura Keller, who was was a, somebody who loaned a lot of the 1980s material to us. So thank you so much, Laura, for watching and also for for the loan. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks. For it's watching. all about community, man. So thank you, guys, everybody who's helped us out. All right. Well, um, until next time, we'll see you. Thanks. Bye. All right, I'm going to end this live stream.